This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Hello, this is Kishore Bhatia for Software Engineering Radio. Today's episode is about serverless architecture with Nate Taggart. Nate is the CEO and co-founder of Stackery, the enterprise serverless operations console. Nate was previously a product manager at New Relic, where he launched New Relic Browser. He ran the data science program at GitHub as a technical product manager. Nate's most recent blogs about serverless are published at stackery.io slash blog. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio, Nate. Thanks, Kishore. All right, today we are going to talk about serverless. We'll understand the motivations for this computing model and do a deep dive learning about serverless architecture, development frameworks, and tools. We'll also learn from Nate's experience with serverless paradigm, developing operations tools at Stackery, and find out various approaches, challenges, and best practices for architecting and building serverless applications. Um, so Nate, uh, before we dive into what serverless is, um, I'd just like to, you know, for our listeners, understand a contextual history of, you know, how did we come here? What is the, uh, you know, the, the distributed computing model that, uh, that led to serverless? Yeah, absolutely. So if we step back in the history of web infrastructure, let's say we go back, you know, 20 or 30 years, uh, people used to buy physical hardware, right? buy a server, they'd install it in their closet. Somebody's job was to actually plug the wires in. And if you got too much traffic, more traffic than the server could handle, the solution would be to buy a bigger server. So this is what we'd call scale scaling vertically. And uh, this worked, it was a very simple model, but it had some challenges too. First off, there was no flexibility in, in scaling. You had to predict in advance how much traffic you were gonna have and buy an appropriately powerful server to handle that. And if you hit a limit, you had to make a a large capital purchase of a bigger server, which could be five or tens of thousands of dollars. As companies got more sophisticated about their infrastructure, they did start to add multiple servers and generally they would load balance traffic across multiple servers. This did give some flexibility in terms of scaling, but still it was a long range planning activity. Uh, eventually, about you know, 10 years ago now, the cloud started to emerge. And instead of buying, spending a big capital expense up front to buy infrastructure, the model was that you could rent infrastructure down to much more granular levels. So you could pick different sizes of servers and you could even rent them by the hour instead of um, having to commit to them for the lifetime of the server. So this is the, the model that you know predominantly has been driven by Amazon, AWS. And for years, it's worked really well. It changed this model that we thought of in terms of vertical scaling, get bigger servers, and it switched to a more horizontal scaling model where you could just add more servers and you could scale them up and down. And ultimately what we were doing here was we were uh, increasing the utilization rate of the servers. So instead of buying a big server that was more capacity than you needed, you can now scale up or scale down. And that worked well, except that uh, as applications became more complex, you can think of big monolithic applications, it became harder and harder to manage the underlying infrastructure to coordinate with application changes. We wanted to make improvements to applications more quickly. We wanted developers to be able to ramp up on a software project more easily. So we started breaking apart these giant monolithic applications into microservices. Now these microservices were much easier to develop because they were smaller portions of functionality. It was quicker and easier for a developer to ramp up on it. But it introduced this problem of orchestration of now you're you're managing multiple layers of complexity when it comes to managing your infrastructure and your utilization rate. So for example, if that one application is now a dozen microservices, you had to individually manage how each of those services scaled. That became complex. And so in the last five years or so, we introduced this idea of orchestration. Now, orchestration is just the idea that individual services can be scaled, turned on, turned off, restarted, recovered, um, flex up or down in terms of capacity. And those services can run atop a cluster of compute resources. 
So now there's essentially two levels that you can optimize on. You can optimize the underlying infrastructure, the cluster of services, or you can optimize at the application level, the individual resources available to each microservice. Now, this works well in terms of managing utilization, and it also helps developers ship applications more quickly, but it in introduces a, a large degree of complexity. You have more points where you're managing scaling. You have more points where you're managing health. And so this became you know, a, a job function that requires some degree of sophistication. And what we're seeing with serverless is that for a large portion of the market, that need for orchestration, while they have it, they have the need because they want to drive efficient use of their infrastructure, they don't necessarily see that as a, a business differentiator for their organization. They don't want to hire and, and develop uh, a deep orchestration uh, skill set because that doesn't really help their organization meet the organization's goals. And so instead they look for other alternatives. And what we found with serverless is that they're able to outsource that skill set, outsource the need for orchestration, let Amazon or, or Microsoft or Google handle the orchestration layer, and instead let their team focus on developing applications and then managing the health of the applications on top of this new model of managed infrastructure. Gotcha. Well, that was pretty, uh, you know, pretty good uh, detailed view on how we came about, say, the the challenges of you know scaling, managing applications, and you know the whole application stack with you know operating systems, libraries, the app environment, and you talked about cost there uh, and the efficient utilization aspect as well. When do you say outsource the need for orchestration at this point? Are you talking more about infrastructure as a service, um, you know, platform as a service? Can you go a little bit deep on that side? Yeah, so orchestration is is really it's a it's an engineering need. You need to um, you know keep all of these microservices connected, allow them to be aware of each other, understand that since they're fundamentally running on physical hardware, hardware fails occasionally. So you need some level of redundancy, some level of uh, healing to to happen on the underlying infrastructure. And so with orchestration, what we've done is we've abstracted away in a sense, we've abstracted the infrastructure from the application so that the application can run on uh, a set of shared resources that can self heal and the application itself can now flex up or down on top of that. So, so what, what kind of um, benefits does that, you know, entail for, uh, you know, for different, um, you know, different aspects of uh, applications. Um, are, are you talking more about it becomes easier to manage uh, just writing code uh, and deploying those apps? Or is it more on the cost side that, that these developments have happened? Yeah, so there's changes to, to every stage of the application lifecycle. From a developer standpoint, uh, it tends to be easier to work with a microservice than a monolithic application. I mean, picture an application that has you know, a million lines of code. It can take a while to ramp up in your understanding of how that application works. And every time you make a change to that application, there's potentially a lot of impacts unintentional that you, that you don't realize will happen to the rest of the application. It's very interconnected and intertwined. But as you start to break that application apart into functional units, um, you know, as, as microservices, that allows a team to say, specialize on authentication or specialize on, you know, a checkout system for the e-commerce site or whatever it is that allows them to ramp up very quickly, become an expert on that part of the code and provides a clean interface to the rest of the application, typically through something like an API. Gotcha. Yep. So more more speed, more functionality uh, that needs to be managed and maintained uh, independently of you know each other when it, when we talk about microservices here. Right. And so that's you know that's on the development side of the house. But keep in mind, typically you develop an application uh, and that may take you know weeks or months, and then you run that application for years. A big part of the application lifecycle is you know, maintaining its availability and health while it's running and, and serving customers. And this microservice model gives you another layer that you can, um, you can manage the performance of the application. You can have some services that, that grow more quickly than others, and you don't have to scale everything linearly. 
Gotcha. Right. So when we talk about serverless, um, are these trends, you know, we just we just discussed, um, you know, scale, manageability, cost, utilization, and also the, the concept of, you know, developing applications at a at a speed as well as at a, uh, you know, um, I think at a functionality level where, you know, modules and ind- individual services, microservices are more independent of each other when it comes to the whole life cycle. Uh, where is the actual trend, you know, driving this? Is it is it more on the business side? Is it is it you know technology that is driving this adoption uh, of a computing model that is more cloud driven uh, and more uh, you know infrastructure um, abstract driven? Yeah, I mean, I think it's fundamentally both. So from a business side, every business, regardless of you know the service that they deliver, they're fundamentally looking to ship products more quickly. They want to increase their velocity. They want to be able to create more value and, of course, capture more value from their customers. And at the same time, they want to manage costs. So they don't just want to throw infrastructure at the problem and and scale up arbitrarily. They want to be able to ensure that they're maximizing their utilization of the infrastructure that they're paying for. And they want to balance that efficiency with, of course, the risk that they might go down or have an error or in some other way fail to deliver their services. But from an engineering standpoint, you know, it's somebody's job to develop these services. And if they're trying to meet an organization's goal of developing and releasing products more quickly, then they have to look for ways where the individual people on their team are able to be more productive. So microservices offers a pattern for that where a developer can ramp up on a team more quickly without having to learn all of the code base. And, you know, of course, there are, there are other patterns, too. And we've seen in the last five years the emergence of containers as, you know, a pattern and trend that people have moved towards. And that helps developers, in, in at least at one level, helps developers maintain consistency between their development environment and production environments and reduces the risk that as they're releasing products and shipping things more quickly, that they're able to do that safely and reliably as well. And in defining, uh, you know, the, the paradigm itself, when we say serverless, we do know that there are servers in serverless. So how would you go about defining that in in a way that it, it you know, comes out technically strong, but also has, uh, you know, a meaning for business, you know, development ops and security folks. So we'll just, uh, you know, go down trying to understand what is serverless. Absolutely. So first off, there's, I think, a lot of debate around what is serverless. Um, some people think of it as uh, a literal compute model, maybe better described as functions as a service. This is a, a code that you develop and will run on demand in the infrastructure provider. I like to think of it more as a development model where uh, an organization is able to take advantage of managed services, managed infrastructure, and in that way, you know, the focus may be on the, the compute level of the application, but could, with this definition, also touch on, you know, data storage and API delivery, um, you know, other aspects of the architecture being fundamentally a managed provided service by a cloud provider. Well, you touched about the the, the definition being more development centric. I mean, you say it's a developing model. How how would you break that into you know various aspects of development that that serverless adds into or, or makes it easier? Can you go down a, a bit you know elaborating? Uh, in you mentioned APIs, you mentioned storage, you mentioned manageability. How does that make developing easier? Yeah. So at the end of the day, developers have uh, a lot of aspects to the job when you look at the entire software delivery uh, lifecycle. So if you could focus and and specialize on a single level of that life cycle, uh, you could potentially increase your productivity pretty dramatically. So, for example, a developer might say, you know, the the way that I add the most value is to focus on writing code, focus on developing the functionality and the business logic of my application. And they may not feel particularly um, skilled at managing the underlying infrastructure. Configuring a network properly is a very different skill set than writing code. And there are people who specialize at each. For small organizations, it can be challenging to build a team that has all of the skill sets required to manage the entire lifecycle. And so managed services can offer a shortcut to that problem. 
But even for large organizations, I mean, if you if your business can focus on building products and delivering products and doesn't have to focus on, you know, managing boilerplate infrastructure that frankly, you know, Amazon or Microsoft can do better than you anyway, there's potentially a competitive advantage that you gain there where your business is focused on building and creating value and your competitors are focused on managing boilerplate um, hardware. Right. That makes sense. And uh, that, that does that apply equally to, as you mentioned, the, the small startup scale uh, teams and, and the large organizations that already have deep expertise in, say, data center management or network database storage management? Yeah. So keep in mind that these businesses are they're always changing. They're always evolving. I think counterintuitively, we've actually seen enterprises embrace serverless much more quickly than the the broad startup market. And I think a big component of that is just uh, how much is at stake? I mean, a large enterprise may be spending millions of dollars a year on infrastructure, and they may have thousands of engineers writing and developing products. Uh, So if they can cut, you know, manage their their infrastructure costs even by 20 or 30 percent, and many of them see even much more significant savings, that can be pretty material. On the other hand, if they can help developers um, ship applications more quickly, that can also be really material in their business. And I think the headlines that we hear a lot about with serverless are that it's so much cheaper to use. And I think there's truth to that. Sometimes that drives businesses to look at serverless. But what I've found is that most businesses embracing serverless are actually doing it because of the velocity that it adds to their team. They find that they're able to to build and release products much more quickly using serverless infrastructure because they have to do less work in planning and managing for capacity, scaling the application, making sure they have high availability. They can outsource that functionality and instead focus on their application and the health of the application. That's an interesting point, and I'd like to come back to the the comparison you know you made on cheaper versus you know velocity of of developing applications. Um, but you know, just earlier during the definition, you said that there are certain uh, definitions out there that also talk about the functions as a service aspect of serverless. Can you define uh, what you mean by functions here, functions as a service, uh, and why is that relevant to serverless? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of um, design patterns that people can embrace when they switch to serverless infrastructure. One thing that's important to understand is that there's um, very rarely a a way to lift and shift. And what I mean by that is it's difficult to take an existing legacy application that's on traditional infrastructure and simply move it to serverless infrastructure. Almost always requires some form of of redevelopment, re-architecture. Now, that said, there's a few different patterns emerging in how people build applications for serverless infrastructure. Now, at a basic level, you can fundamentally build a lot of applications very similarly to how they're built today. Say, for example, you put an API endpoint and connect it to a function as a service. What that would do is, as you got a request to this API endpoint, your code would run and return a response. Now, that looks very much like kind of a traditional infrastructure model. There are some minor changes. For example, that function is not long lived. It will start and stop. And because of that, there's no state that will carry forward from one transaction to another. But still, it fundamentally follows the request response loop that many developers are are used to thinking in as a development model. Function as a service, though, also enables other types of development models. And I think the big one that we see really gaining in popularity right now is what's called an event-driven model. In an event-driven model, you can subscribe your, your code, your functions, to listen to certain event triggers and respond when those triggers happen. So as an example, you could listen for when is a file uploaded to an object uh, storage bucket. When a file gets uploaded, I want my code to run. That's commonly used for something like uh, transcoding videos or um, generating thumbnails. So an image gets uploaded, when uh, my function sees that event happen, it will then generate a thumbnail and and output that to another location. 
This event-driven model is, is interesting because it actually makes applications be uh, feel much more distributed. For example, uh, at an enterprise organization, you may have a, a team focused on marketing functionality that's listening to events that are generated from, say, the e-commerce site. As an example, someone puts an object in a cart and then abandons the cart. Now you could write a function that looks for when the this event happens, when there's this uh, condition in the data, I want to run a function in response to that. Maybe, for example, trigger a marketing email that responds to cart abandonment. And so in this way, we start to see not only is the code itself distributed, running on multiple uh, physical servers behind the scenes, but also the development model is distributed. You have different teams uh, relying on and potentially reacting to both code and events that other teams may be uh, ultimately responsible for managing. That was a great example of you know how event-driven models uh, are are being used in in real functionality. Um, you know you mentioned the, uh, the the file upload use case, and that was actually uh, you know, something where uh, you don't have to have a lot of state, uh, you know, to worry about. So you can actually, you know, put a function behind that that does something based on an event happening. Uh, but more interestingly, uh, you know, this this other model that you were talking about with uh, an e-commerce card, for example, you know, there's there's development uh, of microservices that is distributed and deployed in, and scaled independently based on you know which way you see the most load coming in. Uh, but what is more interesting to me here, and maybe we should probably spend a couple minutes here, is uh, how this also distributes the the team's attention on you know follow up business actions. Like you mentioned, marketing email should go out if the uh, the cart was abandoned. Um, how are you seeing these decisions, um, you know, being made? Are you saying that this is because we've got new new ways of uh, doing event driven designs, uh, you know, more and more uh, creative ways of engaging a customer is coming in? Yeah, so I think it's worth pausing here and, and also calling out the fact that, you know, while event driven uh, software development is really, you know, maybe much simpler with a serverless model, this isn't the first time we've, we've developed enterprise software that responds to distributed events. And for years, we've had, you know, frameworks that incorporate some kind of message bus uh, which is, in, a, in, a, in fact, an event-driven model, um, and many enterprises are used to developing in this way. I think the difference here is that because these events are, are broadly distributed, developers can now build applications that are also broadly distributed, and it makes it much easier to manage if, if you know, say, functionality that you develop becomes much more popular, used much more heavily than, than you anticipated. You can do that very safely and very reliably with serverless infrastructure. And alternatively, if it becomes used uh, maybe less than you anticipated, your costs for running that functionality will be uh, relatively that much lower because serverless generally runs on a pay-per-use type model. Um, so Nate, you mentioned the cost versus the velocity um, on you know developing with serverless models. Uh, and then we did a pretty good example on functions as a service. Um, and again, you know when we do a deep dive, uh, we'll talk about what functions are, how do we develop them. Uh, but let's just go back to the the cost here. Uh, how how do how does one measure the the total cost of ownership or the the return on investment? Uh, for investing in a serverless model? Uh, and what is pushing that from a cost perspective? Yeah, so maybe it's worth stepping back again and looking at the evolution of infrastructure and how cost has changed in that time. Um, and I'm going to talk about some numbers that I think serve as general guidelines. Uh, they're normative to what we see in the industry, but they may not be perfectly representative of every application. So typically, uh, if you look back when we scaled servers vertically, you had to expend a large capital expense, this might be tens of thousands of dollars, up front to buy a powerful large server. And you did that with, uh, in mind, the maximum scale that you would need over potentially a, a one-year or multi-year lifespan of that server. So in this way, you had relatively low utilization rates. You might have utilization rates of only, say, 5% of the capacity of that server. Uh, 
And what I mean by that is, let's say as an, as an arbitrary example, your server is able to handle 10,000 requests per minute. You may typically on average only see something like, you know, 500 requests per minute. And in that way, you have a lot of capacity that's available for peaks in traffic, but that means you've over-provisioned most of the time. Uh, in the scale out model, uh, this was the horizontal scaling that you could get from say a cloud provider like AWS. I think a lot of times we would see that um, companies could drive somewhat higher utilization rate, but still, Scaling out could sometimes take uh, several minutes and depending on the complexity of the, the release, maybe even longer than that. And so companies tended to look at scaling in terms of how much would they need over the course of say several hours. And while they might be quick to scale up, they would be potentially cautious to scale back. And so in this case, it's not uncommon to see utilization rates of say 20% or 25% over the infrastructure. When we introduced containers and orchestration, we had now two ways that we could scale. So you could cluster multiple servers together and create one uh, large compute pool of shared resources and then run applications on top of them. Because some applications may be flexing up while others are flexing down, you could, in theory, drive even higher utilization rates and it's not uncommon to see uh, utilization at 50 or even 60% on a model like this. As an industry standard, I've heard uh, kind of a, a normal best practice would be to scale up at somewhere between 60 and 70% capacity. You want to add another 10% of availability. So with numbers like that, uh, you would typically not see utilization rates higher than 70%. If you hit that level, you would of course scale up. Now with serverless, in theory, you only pay for the time that you're actually using. And instead of paying for infrastructure upfront by buying it or paying for it by the hour, like on a cloud model, you're now paying for it by a fraction of a second. AWS Lambda um, meters uh, throughput, meters pricing, based on one-tenth of a second intervals, 100 milliseconds. So you're getting much closer to paying for exactly what you're using. Now, in theory, that means you're driving a 100% utilization rate. In practice, that's not really the case. Because you're billed at 100 millisecond intervals, if you have a function that takes 99 milliseconds to run, you're almost using exactly what you're paying for. On the other hand, if you have a function that takes 101 milliseconds to run, you pay for 200 milliseconds, even though you're only getting 101. And so therefore, you may still have lower utilization rates than you might expect from this kind of billing model. There's an interesting dynamic here as well, which is that uh, we're, we're shifting the model of who's responsible for planning and managing infrastructure costs. In a, a cluster model or a cloud model or an on-prem owned infrastructure model, you have an operations team or an infrastructure team who's responsible for capacity planning and then managing the cost. Developers build applications to take advantage of the resources that are provided to them by the infrastructure. But what we've done here with serverless is we've changed who's responsible for infrastructure. If developers write functions that are highly efficient, infrastructure of the application will run faster and so therefore you'll be billed for less infrastructure use. On the other hand, if you write applications that are less efficient, you may in fact be billed for more infrastructure for the same level of functionality or, or traffic. Now capacity is responsive to applications instead of applications being responsive to available capacity. So I think there's a big shift that's happening here in, in the mindset of how we think about infrastructure and developing and managing cost. Yeah, that's a pretty interesting point you made there about reversing the whole you know, capacity model to being proactively scaling uh, up or down based on the applications. Uh, and then also the fact that, you know, and this, this was actually a, another question I had in mind um, where uh, are you saying that serverless means you know no operations at all or more and more lesser operations uh, going forward? 
Uh, and then you kind of highlighted the point that, you know, here developers are responsible for breaking down these services into, say, various function calls. And the way they code them, the way they design them is now responsible for what kind of capacity utilization is, is uh, you know, driven. How are you seeing, uh, you know, uh, different models in uh, the cloud providers? You know, we definitely mentioned the AWS Lambda, but are there other serverless infrastructure providers out there? Yeah, so... There are, in fact, uh, multiple providers. Amazon is leading the way today in serverless, although I'd say that Microsoft has a, uh, a well-developed offering and Google also has a, you know, an offering, although I believe Google's is still officially in beta. In all three cases, what we see is that, in general, uh, enterprises are not picking a cloud based on a serverless offering. They're taking their serverless compute functions to the cloud that already has their data, to the cloud that already has their events, to the cloud that already has their you know, networks and authentications and that they're used to deploying to and that they already have skills developed for. That said, I also want to step back and talk about um, the operations point that you mentioned. I think serverless is high in the hype cycle right now. You know, Amazon has shown a lot of growth in their Lambda product. They feature it at uh, reInvent in the past couple of years. And I think we've seen um, increasing investments from Amazon, Microsoft, and Google in their, uh, their cloud serverless offerings. And in response to that, I think we get a little bit swept up in some of the, some of the hype and some of the you know, excitement and buzz around serverless. And just to break some of that down, one, you know, one of the trends that I've heard discussed is this idea of no ops, that as a managed service, there's no operational responsibility for an enterprise consuming a serverless or function as a service offering. That is simply not true. Now, there are parts of operations that in fact do get outsourced to the cloud provider. Availability is clearly outsourced. Scaling is outsourced. Um, orchestration is outsourced in a, in a serverless model. But there's huge parts of operations that are not being outsourced. So uh, managing and maintaining the health of the application, that's certainly not being outsourced. Uh, how you build and release an application with automation and reliability, uh, that's not being outsourced. So I think if you, if you step back and you look at this, um, you know, the application lifecycle, if you look at the DevOps uh, responsibilities, and you say, which ones of these are we really getting rid of and which ones of these are we still fundamentally owning? I think you'll find that there is a significant amount of operations responsibility that still resides with the, the company that's that's running these applications. So very true. Um, still seeing a lot of the, the move from like, you know, the previous operations uh, that we used to have for data centers and, you know, infrastructure moving into more and more of uh, either infrastructure as code or, you know, a lot of focus is, as you mentioned, you know, getting into the automation pieces of uh, managing health, uh, proactively responding to, you know, various events from a self-healing perspective or or just trying to make sure that there is more and more focus on security um, as code. You, you know, I, th there's a pretty good, uh, you know, point here around just the containers uh, being closer to the the more microservices or nano services like model where you can run something stateless for a quick uh, you know single process in a container uh, you know manner and then you can actually scale that on a cluster of available uh, you know VMs. Uh, how do you compare that with um, with where serverless is? And you mentioned functions earlier, so I'm just trying to see if something like containers as a service that a lot of cloud providers now have, like Amazon has ECS. Uh, Google has its own Kubernetes orchestrator for, you know, running these containers in pods. Uh, how does that match up to where serverless is? Uh, is that better? Is it more like that is just one more step closer to serverless? Yeah, so this is interesting because I think we've seen over, in particular over the last six months, the definition of serverless is starting to look more and more like a gradient and, and very less, much less binary. Um, I don't think that there are offerings that are you know, purely serverless and offerings that are absolutely not serverless. And those are the only two categories. Um, Amazon, for example, recently released a product called Fargate. Now Fargate is uh, fundamentally a, a Docker container that you can run on demand. So you develop your application, you put it in a Docker container, just like you might run on top of say Kubernetes. 
Uh, except instead of managing a Kubernetes cluster, you give it to Amazon and run it in a model that looks very much like Lambda. So an event can trigger this Docker container to run. Now with Lambda in particular, you have um, some constraints on how long this function can run for. So at maximum, Lambda's run today for 300 seconds. I think we might suspect that that, that number could change over time, but that's five minutes, a maximum runtime of five minutes. So earlier we mentioned a use case of say video transcoding. Well, if you have a small 30 second video clip, I think it's safe to say you could, you could transcode it in 30 seconds. But what if you have a four hour video clip? Suddenly you, you want something that can be long lived. Now it may still be transactional and it may still not have, you know, multi-track transaction state requirements. And so in a case like that, Fargate could potentially be a hybrid solution. It's not constrained to run in only five minutes. You can run the Docker container uh, essentially as long as needed, uh, but it still looks very serverless-like. It's event-driven, it's uh, stateless between transactions. And um, you, again, you don't have to manage the orchestration or the scaling or the availability or the underlying cluster that it's running on top of. You can also look at some other offerings, like um, you mentioned you know, a managed Kubernetes. Amazon released EKS, Google has for, for a while now how to manage Kubernetes. And of course there are companies like Platform9 that run real Kubernetes with uh, kind of a managed service layer. In each of these offerings, you see uh, various levels of outsourcing for the management of the underlying infrastructure. I think Amazon's model is to give you, you know, the, the big knobs, how do you scale and you know, what are your scaling rules? What type of infrastructure do you want it to run on? And then they try to abstract the actual running of the Kubernetes cluster as much as possible, or at least simplify that management aspect. Um, and then there are offerings, of course, where you're running Kubernetes natively and you're managing all of the cluster and you're managing all of the orchestration and the service discovery and, you know, the availability and the health of the application. And, and now you're looking at something that very much does not look serverless and it does not look like a managed service at all. So, Nate, just uh, diving into the architectural aspects of serverless, uh, what are the components of serverless architecture? Yeah, Kishore, that's a great question. So this is actually where, you know, we've talked about this name functions as a service, as an alternative to serverless. And I think this is a point where that name uh, starts to break down. It places a lot of focus on the compute side of the architecture, the, the function, the code running. Um, and in reality, um, serverless applications use a diverse set of architectural resources, just like other applications do. Uh, at a basic level, a serverless application will typically have at least three components. So the first component is some kind of event trigger. Now that may be an API gateway, it may be an object store, it may be um, you know, listening to say a queue or a stream. And then it's gonna have the compute component, the function itself with the code that runs. Um, this would be something like a, a Lambda or you know, an Azure function. And then it's also going to have some kind of state management. So almost all applications, and certainly not all, but most applications do in fact need some kind of state. And since uh, serverless you know, functions are stateless, typically what developers are doing is that they're storing state in some other service, like for example, uh, a database. Um, it could be a traditional database, um, or it could be something like a, say DynamoDB or um, Amazon is now releasing something called uh, Aurora Serverless, which is uh, essentially a, a SQL-like database that um, doesn't require you to manage the underlying infrastructure. So this is this looks like, I think, a basic serverless architecture. You have, say, an API endpoint connected to a function that has uh, access to a database. But in reality, most serverless applications are even more complex. Uh, they may involve multiple event sources. They will uh, frequently involve, involve multiple functions or compute uh, nodes. And then they may, uh, of course, use multiple databases, multiple types of databases, and other resources like message queues, um, event streams, uh, network layers, um, 
you know, all of the a cache, say, all of the components that you might use for a traditional architecture. I think, again, the difference in thinking here for serverless is that as much as possible, those become managed services that a developer, in theory at least, does not need to configure or manage the, the scaling for. This is actually probably a, a good point to also call out that functions in this case is possibly an overloaded term. There is, of course, the ability to deploy a function, which is you know, a, a small granular piece of code that does one discrete task. Uh, and that's, I think, how developers have used the word function for the last uh, couple of decades. But in this case, this function as a service, this compute node, can actually be complex. Your function can have uh, you know, requirements. So you can uh, use libraries just like you might normally do. The function can also uh, actually serve as a, a full application. You can have multiple files. You can have multiple uh, functions. Again, we've overloaded that word. So your compute node could run an application which itself in the code has multiple functions. Uh, you could even have some kind of application router, which said, you know, say takes an event source and figures out what kind of event it is and then runs the, the correct um, code function uh, to serve that event. And so in this way, I think we, we're also seeing a divergence of patterns. And I, over time, this may consolidate, but there may in fact be multiple use cases where one or the other makes more sense for different applications. That's pretty interesting as an architecture. I come from the uh, service-oriented architecture world, and it's uh, it's it has been actually an interesting uh, view on how a lot of the microservices architecture replicates some of the, the concepts that you would you would earlier do, just that you know, you wouldn't have as commoditized or cheaper computing power and the fact that you'd have gRPC and like JSONs and, you know, more lighter weight uh, ways of doing REST HTTP calls today. Uh, and that's why I think more and more applications back then in the uh, in the early 2000s were, uh, were communicating with each other on the protocol level differently, uh, being monolithic in its, in its own sense. But I do have another question on the architecture here. Um, where is the... The application, um, uh, you know, uh, structure growing in in terms of uh, how do you actually accept traffic from the outside. So I'm just trying to get into the the load balancing aspect of it or the scale aspect of it. Like how do you uh, how do you route traffic from from Amazon's uh, you know internal uh, external and internal uh, you know firewall rules and load balancers, uh, and then how do you deal with uh, storage uh, when it comes to um, you know going outside of just the database. Um, is it is it all managed by the service provider, or do you still have to you know worry about routing rules and and thinking about you know database as a service um, and NS3 and things like that? Yeah, good question, and I, I'd say a complex question because um, you know I don't want to oversimplify and and act like there's only one solution here. I think in truth there are uh, you know as many architectures uh, as there are companies developing them. I see. That said, there are some patterns that are pretty typical. So a typical interface uh, to the outside world for a serverless application would probably be an API gateway type of service. Now, Amazon has, in fact, an API gateway. Um, there are also other uh, API gateway providers. Uh, Mashapes Calm is an example of a you know, third-party API gateway. Uh, and you know, some companies could uh, develop their own API gateway and might actually run on a server and just uh, farm traffic to serverless applications. I think typically, though, to be a traditional serverless application, you're probably looking to couple managed services with your, your compute layer. And in that way, um, you know, Amazon's API gateway sitting in front of a Lambda starts to look like a pretty typical model. This load balancing aspect is, uh, again, typically not going to be an actual problem for a software developer to deal with if they're using uh, a managed serverless product. So with uh, AWS Lambda or Microsoft Azure Functions, Microsoft and Amazon are now responsible for that availability, that scaling, that load balancing, and the, you know, the actual pr provisioning. So think about you've released an application that has an API gateway connected to, say, a Lambda. And that's the entire application. 
You get one request from that API gateway, and that Lambda will, behind the scenes, run on a server inside of, of Amazon's uh, data center. Now, what happens if you start getting multiple concurrent requests? Well, now that uh, behind the scenes, as an implementation detail, that Lambda could actually be running on multiple physical servers. And in fact, as you scale, it will be you know, queued up to run on, on even more physical machines, um, each one of them running independently. They don't share state. This is the, the part of serverless, which is stateless, of course. And there are some other implementation details that, that may, may in fact matter into how you manage and run your application. So one of them is that each of those services will create, or servers, I'm sorry, will create their own uh, logs, their own log streams based on the transactions that ran through that physical machine. So in this case, if you're trying to look at the logs, say for a serverless application, instead of looking through a single you know, log stream or a single log file, you may in fact have to aggregate through multiple log streams to find the transaction you're concerned with. Another consideration is what are known as cold starts. So the first time that a serverless function runs, it uh, will boot up the actual runtime. You can kind of think of this like a micro container, right? And I'll load that, that instance and the runtime and the code. And depending on the programming language, that could take anywhere from, say, half a second for you know, maybe a lightweight node application to several seconds for a heavier Java application. Once that application runs, it'll be cached. And each subsequent call to that function on that same machine will run much more quickly. It doesn't have to reboot up the, the runtime. So if you have an application that scales up very quickly, it's Amazon's job or Microsoft's job to uh, create that availability, to distribute your code and your function on multiple machines. But you may in fact hit a scenario where because you're scaling up quickly, your function is being delivered on more and more machines, which are not warmed, they're not cached. Uh, you could in fact hit a bunch of cold starts and have your application performance be degraded Long term, I would expect that this is a concern for serverless that will go away over time. And for many applications, it's, it's not even an issue today. If, for example, you're running some kind of background task, this is not a customer facing solution. It's something that doesn't have real time needs. These cold starts are, you know, annoying at worst, right? But if you're serving a customer facing API and you know some percentage of your traffic, probably some non-negligible percentage of your traffic is hitting these, these cold boots, it could potentially be a customer facing performance issue that you would want to be aware of and be addressing in your architecture and your application design. This again can have implications in how you actually architect the application. So remember we talked about um, the model of having larger functions that do you know multiple multiple means multiple features if you run one lambda that has in its code multiple functions you you may in fact have a higher probability of being able to keep that lambda warm over the entire application whereas if you decompose that into each code function has its own lambda that it runs in you have more chances of hitting hitting cold cold starts and so i think there are you know, there are two things that are happening here. One is this managed service does have some implementation details that a developer should probably be aware of and that could impact the architecture. And two, the technology itself is still evolving. And I would expect that this trend is, you know, slowly addressed by the service providers and will eventually become uh, of a non-issue and for certain types of applications may already be a non-issue. I see. That was a pretty interesting take on like, you know, a developer's perspective of, say, architecting an application in a, the serverless model. I think you also covered the, the part where um, some of the, the code starts, you know, log streams, for example, how do you aggregate them? How do you debug things? Uh, there was another, you know, uh, set of questions around uh, if I have to do, a, you know, a deep dive on architecting uh, a serverless application from the ground up, uh, we're not even talking about you know, migrating or transforming something. What kind of approach, uh, you know, have you seen uh, taken uh, between a, a role that is more developer centric versus a role that is more, say, technology program manager or a CIO, CTO who's trying to do, you know, buying and, and evaluating decisions on going serverless? So let's take the, the developer first and then we go into the, uh, 
you know, the technology decision maker roles and, and evaluate the same question in, in two different ways. Yeah. So one way that we could discuss this is how companies are, in fact, um, choosing to use serverless, what that adoption pattern looks like. Because I think this is really telling on, on how those decisions are made and how the different stakeholders um, react and what drives them. Right. In every enterprise company we've worked with, we've seen that um, serverless was initially brought in by a single developer or a small development team. We call this the rogue developer. One person has a project that they need to ship and they discover that it's quicker to do this by shipping a Lambda than it is by having an architecture review meeting and a provisioning meeting and planning the capacity and you know building and packaging up a, a container and then uh, ultimately provisioning it with the ops team and, and then running it. They say, you know what, I can bypass that. I can write my function. I can have it running in an hour and I'm just gonna do that. So from a developer standpoint, a lot of times Lambda can just be seen as a way to circumvent a heavyweight infrastructure process. Now, there's a lot of truth to that. It is faster and easier to ship code using Lambda in a lot of cases, but there are some concerns based on what the type of application is that's being developed. So if this is, say, a background task, which is what we typically see these rogue developers starting with, it's not mission critical, it's not customer facing, maybe it has low visibility in the organization, there's relatively low risk to try a new development model. And because they're able to ship quickly and get a quick win, they may in fact be praised for making this decision where they've introduced a new technology. Um, that can grow to other teams seeing the win and wanting to replicate that pattern and serverless kind of spreading throughout the organization in this way. It's kind of a bottoms up way of distributing the new, uh, the new model. That said, it can introduce some challenges to the organization as a whole. And this is where we see, say, a director of operations or a VP of engineering, or in fact, even a CIO or CTO getting involved as a stakeholder. As serverless proliferates through the organization, there are some concerns that will emerge. The use cases tend to evolve. The visibility raises. The criticality of the application may in fact rise. And you know, as more use cases are discovered and more serverless is applied throughout the organization, it becomes increasingly important to standardize on how these uh, functions are being released, to register them somewhere so that you have an inventory and you know what functions are available and have been developed to um, create policies around how do we set up IAM roles or permissions? What's the security model? Um, how do we standardize our release process? How do we roll back? How do we get error visibility? How do we recover from uh, a health crisis in the application? I think these are the standard questions that a CIO or a CTO is gonna ask of any infrastructure and any application throughout the organization. But with serverless, a lot of these questions have historically been um, hard to answer. And that's part of the reason why, you know, I, for example, have focused uh, our, our company on surveying operations needs in the serverless market. That's a, that's a perspective that I do wanna go down in uh, trying to understand uh, the increasing importance and maybe visibility uh, into uh, policies and standard, you know, like standard approaches. And then a, a major part of that is also security. Um, you know, how do you manage security in a, in a serverless world for both applications, you know, edge security, um, and then making sure that it's not just, uh, you know, feeling like it's secure, but it's actually secure. But we'll go down into that in, in the next section. Um, you mentioned something more about, uh, you know, how this, uh, this small visible, you know, low risk application can then slowly you know, start becoming more and more uh, proliferated, I'd say, or, you know, getting into uh, the, the visibility of the, uh, the ops folks. And then, uh, then folks start, you know, trying to understand how do you standardize this for a larger scale uh, application development effort. Uh, when someone's trying to do this from, a, from an architecture perspective, are there still benefits or concerns that are driving this adoption for a CIO, like trying to do a new transformation on capacity, scale, availability, you know, all, all those kind of uh, abilities um, that, that serverless solves by default. Is, is there any, you know, direct approach to someone saying, you know, from the top down that we want to go serverless, let's just go start doing that. Have you seen that kind of an approach 
or is it more like we're already as part of our cloud journey doing some some of these things uh, it doesn't hurt to show some quick wins uh, by trying something new yeah we've definitely seen two approaches to adopting serverless the first and again the most common by far is this bottoms up approach where you have individual developers bringing it in as a technology that enables them to increase their velocity that said, if you read the headlines in the serverless market, you'd probably be inclined to think that companies are saying, let's cut our infrastructure costs by switching to serverless. I haven't actually seen that in the market. Every enterprise that we talk to who's had a top-down approach to serverless has fundamentally been driven by some strategic need in the organization. And these typically fall into three categories. Either the company is looking to move to the cloud and they're saying, if we're moving to the cloud, what are the cloud technologies that we should be embracing? For example, if we have to re-architect our application, or if we're going to have to touch legacy code in order to facilitate this move to the cloud, we might as well, we have an opportunity now to modernize the application and take advantage of the cutting edge uh, development model. So we, might, we, we should embrace serverless, we should do it intentionally, and we should use our, our migration to the cloud as a driver for that. The second driver that we see is a move towards DevOps. In a lot of organizations, uh, they've been hearing about DevOps for a decade, uh, and they've been slowly trending in a more agile model, but they've yet to fully embrace the, the DevOps model. Serverless, I think, natively enforces DevOps as a model. Think about the, the idea behind DevOps, that developers and operations are interlinked, that there's a team uh, responsible for managing the entire life cycle of the application. Well, with serverless, if you want, for example, access to logs on the compute resource, you have to manage logging in advance. The serverless function will start up, run the code, and then die off. There's no server to SSH into and retroactively collect logs. Now, this is a somewhat trivial example, but I think it illustrates how the model is changing. Developers have to be forward thinking about what the operational needs are of managing this application throughout its life cycle. Serverless enforces a DevOps pattern in the development cycle and then carries through to the operation side of the life cycle of the application. Uh, finally, we see uh, a trend towards microservices, a strategic goal of moving to distributed architectures, distributed applications, or a microservice pattern being a driver towards serverless. If you're an organization who's been managing monolithic applications for years, possibly for decades, you're probably familiar with the fact that it's difficult to onboard new engineers to the team. It takes them a while to ramp up and become proficient in the code base because there's a lot to learn. Uh, and it's also difficult to manage that application. Monolithic applications uh, tend to have higher infrastructure requirements, higher needs in terms of, uh, of capacity of resources, and can be difficult to scale granularly. And so there's a lot of good, you know, compelling reasons from an engineering side, but also from a, a business side that might uh, steer an enterprise organization towards embracing a microservice development pattern. Now, if you have a monolithic application and you're saying, all right, we're going to stop you know, extending the monolith and we're going to start augmenting it with uh, microservices. Let's say we're gonna take one component of our application, say authentication, and we're gonna break this out of the monolith and we're gonna develop a microservice for this. Now you go and you look at the, the technology in the market and you say, what's the easiest, quickest way for us to ship this, uh, this new microservice? And you might be drawn to serverless because it's a pretty compelling offer. You don't have to learn Kubernetes. You don't have to manage orchestration. You don't have to develop a team around scaling and availability of this uh, critical service while you're also focused on breaking apart your monolith and building the new service. And meanwhile, this is not really new functionality your organization is developing. So you may be under pressure to deliver this very quickly and get back to building roadmap work. And so these drivers, a lot of times, will steer a CIO, a CTO, a VP of engineering, a VP of operations or infrastructure towards intentionally embracing serverless and pushing this pattern throughout the organization. That gives a broad uh, view on how technology management 
and you know CIOs, CTOs are looking at um, you know adopting serverless. Going down towards the tool sets and you know the variety of um, you know functions as a service, event driven you know models that are available. Does one actually need uh, as a developer, say, new languages or system design coding practices to take advantage of the, the serverless paradigm, or is it something you can just directly jump in with uh, existing experience? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'd say serverless is relatively easy to get started with in a in a hello world kind of way. Uh, there are a number of frameworks that make it very easy to get your first function up and running. There are also some really fun, easy projects that you can get started with. A great example would be to build something like an Alexa skill. Uh, Alexa skills actually run on Lambda. And so you could build a, a small function. You can make a little game or, or have a uh, a tool that you can extend your Alexa to do for you. And you could probably build that in a day or a weekend and, and get up and running pretty quickly. That said, once you extend beyond the hello world functionality, once you decide you're going to build you know, an enterprise scale application or a professional application, it has to run in production, it has to meet you know, monitoring requirements and have uh, some reliability, some health performance, uh, an SLA, suddenly Lambda becomes a little trickier and it does require a learning curve for developers and for teams. Now, on a team that has multiple disciplines, say a team that has um, some, some developers and also some operations experts on the team, you probably already in fact have the skills as a team to, to ship a serverless application and do it pretty reliably. Um, that said, if you're just a developer and you're trying to build a serverless uh, application, there's probably gonna be a learning curve for you. For example, Let's say you're building uh, your first serverless application on Amazon and you're gonna do it at work. This may be the first time you've had to write CloudFormation template. This may be the first time you've had to configure other services in AWS. Again, we talked about what a basic serverless architecture looks like. It's not just Lambda. There are, at, you know, at some level, there's an event source. There's probably some kind of uh, data store. And then there's a bunch of services that you probably want to be using that aren't uh, very obvious. So for example, each one of those resources is going to need IAM roles, uh, permissions, a security model. You're going to want to apply you know, CloudWatch logs and metrics collection. You're probably going to want to instrument for some kind of uh, error visibility. Find a way to get uh, health metrics out of your application. Find a way to get diagnostics out if you have a failure so that you can recover from it and correct that problem. So in this way, there is going to be a learning curve. It's not just write code and you're good to go. Um, and I think that's where the hype cycle and the reality of serverless are diverging today. Um, you will have to take an operational look, and there's some skills you're going to want to develop as you're doing that. Right. That that sounds like there's also a learning curve for developers to start you know, looking at some of the uh, cloud operations uh, and cloud services that are available from from a serverless provider. Uh, and in some sense, you know, is it fair to say that if you're looking at serverless platforms and programming in this model, uh, you would have to also start understanding the the complete ecosystem from the from the cloud provider. So, for example, you mentioned AWS. You know, various services we talked about: IAM, you know, event sources, data store, you know, API gateways. Uh, would that would that mean that as a single developer uh, trying to get a, a holistic understanding of the serverless um, you know, model, I would have to actually understand AWS's existing services and then how do I make use of some of the offerings like CloudFormation templates and, and CloudWatch and, and things like that? Yeah, so I think with a naive approach, the answer is yes. Uh, you will have to learn these other services. You will have to learn, um, say, CloudFormation or some other you know, configuration tool you are going to have to learn some of the implementation details in you know, how you configure uh, a VPC or an API gateway or a data store. That said, I do think there's another way to look at this, which is, um, and this is something developers have been doing for decades and shouldn't be a new idea. This is the point of tools. So if you're working uh, in an area which requires some, some new skills, uh, chances are someone has gone before you, figured out how to do that, developed some best practices, and incorporated those into some kind of tool, a framework, a platform. Uh, uh, in our case, you know, we call it a, a console 
uh, but it's a way to standardize and take the experience that others have developed and incorporate that into your work uh, kind of in a, in a plug and play kind of way. I see. So that's more like, uh, you know, if you can have like a, an abstraction of all of these services under the under the hood and have a tool set ready for, for a complete development platform. Uh, and that's actually something I want to understand uh, more from examples that you have seen uh, both in Stackery and, and, you know, generally in the serverless world. Uh, what are the, some of the common tools for designing, architecting serverless applications or or like even from a development world? Are there more like IDEs that you have to go to or is it just the same uh, like Lambda has its own way of writing a function? Uh, I can write it in, in Java or and then when it comes to, you know, uh, deploying it on, say, running it on my local machine versus actually trying to deploy that um, at a at a you know testing or a production level. Uh, how do I go about doing that? So just trying to walk through the tool ecosystem in a serverless development uh, model. That's great. So really quickly, let's start with what does it look like if you don't have tools? So if you don't have tools, um, and just for for um, consistency, we'll talk about the the AWS uh, environment. So let's say you don't have tools. Um, Amazon Lambda has uh, four, actually today now, five programming languages you can use. You can use Python, Node, Java, C Sharp, or Go. So you pick one of the languages, whichever one you like, and you write your code. Pretty freeform. There's not really a, a, a way you have to write it or structure it. Um, there is, of course, uh, an input value that you'll get from that event that triggers it to run. Um, so you, you know you should know what that object looks like. But once you get the event, you can do whatever you'd like with it. So with again, without tools, you'll log into AWS console, you'll copy and paste your code into a form field, hit submit, and you'll have uh, a Lambda running. Now, if you like to use libraries, um, which I think most developers do, you're going to find that there is actually some packaging requirements. You have to download the, the dependencies. You're going to bundle up your code. You're going to create a zip file. You'll want to upload that to AWS. It's a little more complex release process. And then again, you're going to have to configure it to run based on the reaction of some event. So you're going to need to know how to set up at least one other service and configure that in AWS. Uh, and again, an uh, Alexa skill is a, a great way to get started because um, Alexa will generate the event. There's an actual uh, Alexa skills kit that kind of walks you through this process and it will let you focus mostly on just the code and the Lambda. So it's an easy entry point. But again, now let's say we're, we're breaking out of this and we're gonna actually do this professionally. We need a, a more robust architecture and we're gonna start applying tools to the process. A lot of companies will start with uh, some kind of tool there's uh, typically some code frameworks, so uh, Apex, uh, serverless framework, um, SAM, which is a, an Amazon framework, um, are some different ways that you can structure your code and define your architecture and release. Um, most of those will help you with um, deployment at some, some level. The difference here, though, is uh, you, know, you, you do get some level of abstraction. But once you break out beyond, say, a function and beyond maybe an API endpoint, you'll probably have to start writing the, the rest of your architecture in some version of CloudFormation. Now, it may be raw CloudFormation, it may be you know, a slightly modified uh, syntax, but in any event, you're ultimately going to have to learn how to describe your architecture. Um, there are a few other tools on the market that you may wanna apply to the problem. So there are two uh, leading monitoring tools. One of them is called IOPipe. That's a great tool that'll give you visibility into the performance of your application. And another one is called Dashboard, and that will give you some um, ability to collect some performance. And also, um, I think it's, it's more focused on, say, debugging and testing. So it might be an, an early tool to try. Uh, and then finally, uh, Stackery, my company, has an operations tool. So with Stackery, you don't actually write the CloudFormation. You can drag and drop your resources onto a canvas, and then we'll generate the CloudFormation for you. Now, you also want to think about how do you actually release the application. So think about a build pipeline. You're going to store your code somewhere. Say it's in GitHub. Some way, you're going to have to get it from GitHub into AWS. Now, if you're using something like SAM Local or Serverless Framework 
or um, Stackery, there's an actual build and release process that, that you can run. If you're doing it without tools though, you're probably stuck with copy and pasting. And if you're used to using other kinds of tools in your architecture, say Terraform or something like that, you're probably going to find that it's not well suited to managing serverless specific applications. It's more general purpose. So things like packaging up your, your functions, your libraries, um, you may have to develop your own process for. A few years back, the companies that were getting involved in serverless earliest, I'd say they developed a lot of this tooling in-house, but today most companies aren't doing that. They're looking through the market, they're finding what's going to work best to meet their needs, fit into their workflow, and they're bringing a tool like that into their, their company to, again, take advantage of what the real benefits of serverless are, which is velocity. They don't want to build tools, they want to ship product, and so they're focusing on that with their team. Interesting coverage there. There's, uh, it seems that there's uh, an ever-growing list of tools that are also adding into the majority of serverless platforms. Yeah, I mean, serverless as a market is only a few years old at this point. And I think what we saw is a handful of companies emerged um, in the last few years. The earliest ones were really focused on how do I build applications? And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. The first problems that you're going to need to solve as you're trying serverless is how do I build a serverless application? And I think what we're finding is that um, that need is really shifting. So companies like Stackery and companies like IOPipe have taken it from, you know, how do I build an application to how do I operationalize an application? How do I run it in production? How do I get visibility? How do I get control? How do I standardize my release cycle? How do I integrate it into the rest of my team's workflow? Um, and I think what we're going to find is over the next few years, more and more tooling will emerge that actually focuses on running applications and maintaining the health of applications. Great examples there. Um, so we did cover from a tool set example, the, the development lifecycle using serverless application, uh, you know, development languages for Lambda, for example, in the runtime. We also looked at, um, you know, some of the options to, to actually look at uh, monitoring and performance. Uh, I do want to like discuss quickly about your uh, views um, from 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 experiences. You know, doing it live with Stackery's platform. Uh, how do you go about debugging and testing something that goes wrong, both in the in in a developer's local environment, uh, maybe with a cloud, uh, and then also in uh, in a test or a production environment? How do you actually go about like debugging? Um, you know, or, or maybe even acting upon a, uh, upon a monitoring event that just came in, uh, and then you know trying to fix it. Yeah, so um, I, I will say, you know, I want to I want to keep this from being uh, too Stackery focused. Um, we use Stackery to build Stackery; it's very meta, um, and so I think our workflow might look a little bit different than somebody who's just getting into serverless. Um, the cloud providers each have slightly different models as well. So let's kind of talk through what does it look like without tooling for each cloud provider. And then we can go back and, and think about what does it look like if you're using something like uh, like Stackery or another tool. Cool. So um, Amazon has uh, a specific um, position, which they they um, champion that you don't do local development with serverless. You you may in fact write your code locally, but you're running it in the cloud. Now there's some advantages to this. For one, you're actually running it in a real production-like environment. So there aren't any inconsistencies between development and production, at least in theory. Of course, it comes with some disadvantages too. You write your code, it takes a couple minutes to release that into the cloud, and that's, you know, if you've gotten good at it. And in that, you know, in that time, in those couple minutes, uh, you, you now have kind of a break in the cycle. You've maybe had, you know, you've kind of switched context a little bit, and uh, you know it can be slow. If you have to make a change, test it, make a change, test it, and each time you have to wait a few minutes, uh, it can be it can be tricky. Um, still, that is the preferred model for Amazon. It's what they really champion, and there are some tools like Sam Local that they're releasing to try to make it a little bit easier. The problem with those tools is that while it's true, it may help you run your Lambda. Um, again, these these architectures are not just Lambda; they're you know distributed platforms that touch a bunch of different services, and it's impossible to replicate all of AWS on your local machine. You probably don't have you know Dynamo running locally, and you don't have API Gateway running locally. 
And so you, you get into a scenario where, you know, you're maybe trying to, you know, mock up, stub out some of these different services, and you're spending a lot of time, you know, trying to recreate the environment instead of just shipping it to the cloud, which is uh, what Amazon champions. Now, uh, Microsoft, and I will call out that while I've, I've used uh, Azure Functions, I haven't used them as extensively as AWS. But I will say that that Microsoft uh, has a history of building developer tools, you know, Visual Studio and uh, other IDEs that they, they've released. And in, so Microsoft, I think, takes a more developer-centric approach, a less infrastructure-centric ap approach. And they provide tools that um, help you quickly test, debug, run applications and release them to the cloud. If you're just getting started with serverless and you don't already use a cloud, I think it'd be perfectly reasonable that you'd use you know, Azure first. I think they have a great development centric uh, process. That said, if you're already in AWS, if you have data there, if you have other resources there, chances are it's not worth switching for this and you should just go to where your data exists. So this is, this is uh, you know, kind of the model if you, if you don't have tooling, let's talk about if you do have tooling. So if you're using something like say SAM, SAM is uh, specific to AWS, but it gives you a way to structure your code, gives you a way to at least uh, run SAM local and, and you know test or run your, your functions. Um, if you wanna do something like you know unit testing, that might be a good, a good way to do it. Um, but ultimately then you're gonna release and run it in the cloud to connect it to all the other services that, it, that it's working with. If you're using something like Stackery, and now we're getting into kind of how our team builds, Stackery manages uh, multiple environments as part of the way that it works. So we integrate with your um, version control. So someone on our team will create a branch in GitHub, they'll make their changes, they'll release that to their own environment, which is a, a, a kind of a sandbox around their code in our shared AWS account. They're able to test it, potentially break it, doesn't matter because it's sandbox, they won't step on anyone else's toes. And when they're satisfied that they, you know, their, their code's ready, they can, they can merge that back in, go through the PR process. Uh, when it's merged into master, that'll trigger an automatic release cycle, which will you know, promote that new uh, master branch out into production. And so in this way, we, we, we have kind of an automated release cycle. It doesn't require developers to uh, you know, manually do anything other than what they've already done. They can continue to use their same IDEs, um, go through the same PR process. From a developer standpoint, very little changes. Yeah, that's a great uh, overview of the ecosystem uh, that is available today, uh, both without tooling and with tooling. I do want to get down into the security aspects as we covered some of the things before on, you know, how does one developer go about uh, creating a serverless application? And then, you know, we talked about operations aspect of releasing it, deploying it, and the monitoring part. Uh, what is um, the whole, you know, services, access controls, service areas for attack, you know, data isolation, what are those kind of uh, concerns um, or even like benefits that you have seen uh, coming in from serverless? Um, and then we probably would have questions around uh, the, the whole application architecture. Yeah, so I'd say, um, you know, serverless security is becoming a more and more prevalent topic. And I think the thinking around it is still emerging. So let me at least share my thoughts on the topic, but know that this is probably a moving target today. First off, I think some people would worry that the attack surface on serverless is relatively large, right? Uh, your functions may be running on any number of physical machines that you don't have control over, and it can be difficult to um, enforce a security model on you know, n number of machines that aren't yours. That said, I would argue that the, the surface area for a serverless application is relatively contained because there's no state and each transaction is isolated in an environment. So it's impossible for me to egress from my transaction to your transaction. So even in that case, if there, there was you know, certain types of security vulnerabilities, um, and I don't think you know a serverless application is immune to security vulnerabilities by any sense, but still it does it does isolate some concerns because you have these um, functions that are spinning up, running a transaction, and then spinning down, shutting off. 
Another way to think about, you know, security around serverless is in terms of, um, you know, security policies, um, IAM roles and permissions that can be applied to these functions. Now, I'd say this is both a, a, a plus and a minus in the way that serverless architectures work. On the one hand, because you can decompose your application into individual functions, you can create very granular permission systems that isolate a function to doing only what it's supposed to do. Uh, and in that case, I would say, you know, that's, that's a great security model. Instead of having to give a machine access to everything that the application is going to do, you have a single function access to only what that function is going to do. On the other hand, uh, the human element kind of throws a wrench into that security model. If you have a small team of operators, uh, maybe you know, working with security experts, uh, they can control the policies on every single application release pretty centrally, right? But if you have hundreds of developers that are creating infrastructure changes as they change code, if those developers aren't thinking about IAM roles and permissions, if they're not consistently applying them, um, if they're not, uh, you know, well versed in what the different permissions are and how they work, you do run a risk that, um, you know, as you have more cooks in the kitchen, you potentially can make a mistake or have gaps or leave something out. Um, the last thing I'll say around um, security for serverless is that because the infrastructure model has changed, because you don't have access in 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 the, the broad sense to the underlying machines. A lot of the security tools that you might be using, things you may have purchased or you know, potentially even open source projects, will no longer work. So you might find that you're, you're looking for new coverage or new ways to solve um, security problems that previously you'd already addressed. So if you think, for example, you know, you're used to running, say, some kind of uh, a daemon on a machine that's going to look for changes and report those up somewhere, um, you probably can't run that anymore. And so you, you may have to just think about uh, security from fresh eyes and a fresh perspective if you start moving to serverless. One thing I do want to call out if security is a concern for your organization, though, is that, again, early use cases for serverless tend to be uh, background tasks, non-mission critical work, low visibility work, not very sensitive uh, projects. And so in that case, you might be able to start with serverless, build some competency, build some confidence, and build your security model, your policies, your practices, and get that dialed in now so that as you scale up, as serverless spreads throughout the organization, you're standardized early on what the right approach is, and you're, you're, you're being uh, a little more forward-looking in that way. Well, that's a great suggestion on also thinking about building in some uh, internal expertise and capabilities with serverless uh, without boiling down the ocean with, say, a large, you know, e-commerce or like customer-facing application that has uh, risks all over. So thanks for covering the the various topics around tooling, operations. Um, you know, how does a developer go about developing, you know, and and deploying uh, serverless applications, Nate? Uh, and it was also good to know that there is uh, an evolving thought around, you know, security. We kind of discussed uh, the hype around why people think that serverless has more of an edge security or attack surface problem, but you know, there's also things to look at from an access control, um, data isolation uh, perspective. Comparing the adoption uh, space between startups and, and enterprises, I'd like to now see if uh, you've got any views and learnings from uh, domains, you know, verticals in the industry right now as to what architectural patterns are evolving and, and which one of those verticals like you know, IoT, finance, healthcare are evolving uh, with serverless models. Yeah, so I'd like to um, touch on this from a couple of different directions. Um, first, I know this may be surprising, a little counterintuitive, but we are seeing the general curve coming from the enterprise. Um, enterprise seems to be leading the way in adoption of serverless. And in particular, it might not be the enterprises that you're thinking of. These aren't typically you know, technology-focused, bleeding-edge technology adopters. In fact, some of the earliest, most public adopters are coming from industries that have historically been technology laggards. Um, there are four industries that we see really pioneering serverless, and those are media, finance, retail, and logistics. Think like shipping companies. Um, so that, those may be kind of surprising industries, but if we step back and think about 
how is serverless being used? What are some of the problems that it's solving? I think you can see why lagging industries would be even more compelled to adopt serverless. First off, those industries probably haven't bet uh, on containers and orchestration heavily yet. So they're going from you know maybe a, a model or two in older generations up to the, the latest trend, and they have a higher ROI for making the switch. The other, of course, driver here is that there are use cases that serverless does really well. It tends to be great for very short-lived transactional kinds of work. And that is exactly the kind of work that you know finance companies face or retail companies face. So I think what we see here is a trend towards um, you know, improve velocity, embrace DevOps, embrace microservices, but do it through a managed interface, a managed service provider. Um, maybe, you know, not have to build all of the orchestration skills in house and uh, focus on the use cases of the organization that's driving a lot of these industries. One other thing I'd like to touch on, because I think it's a it's a really interesting fit and maybe is a little bit more of a, of a tech forward industry is IOT use cases. So serverless has one really great advantage, which is that it scales up very quickly and it's relatively cost efficient at any scale, whether it's scaled up or scaled down. IOT really relies on that kind of mechanic to service the product's life cycle um, as the you know internet connected device connects to the back end and shares data or downloads updates. Serverless is a good fit for this. And so we've seen some of the leading adopters in serverless like iRobot, uh, the makers of Roomba, they're big serverless adopters. Um, GE, GE has a lot of IoT devices that they're starting to um, bet on serverless with. And so what we see, um, again, how the advantages of serverless apply not just to the engineering problems, but also to the business's goals. Um, to managing costs, increasing velocity, and being able to adapt to any scale or unpredictable scale. Um, serverless tends to be a fit in those cases, and that's what's driving the adoption, not necessarily companies just trying to get onto the bleeding edge of technology. That's a pretty interesting take on where um, uh, and how the companies are applying that and, and directly jumping into serverless, even if they had had like uh, a long period of uh, data center driven, uh, you know, development practices from a, from a trend perspective in maturity level, wh- where do you see, uh, more and more, uh, platform providers, uh, you know, headed, where do you see more and more in, in, in the future, where is serverless computing generally in, in terms of that? Yeah. So obviously serverless is still early. Amazon released AWS Lambda about three years ago. And while I, I, point to some examples of serverless models existing prior to that, I'd say that was the first mainstream implementation of what we think of today as serverless. That said, in only three years, uh, Microsoft has matched Amazon. Google has matched Amazon. IBM is betting on kind of an open source implementation. There's a number of companies that have developed uh, ways to run a function as a service type orchestrator on top of Kubernetes. So I think we're actually seeing lots of evolution in the technology very quickly. Now, a big part of that is how quickly it's being adopted. When you have a technology that's predominantly adopted by startups and small businesses, even if you get a large number of companies to switch, their relative market size and scale means there's still not a lot of money in the market. In this case, it's being led by enterprises. And so I think when you have that much money, when you have enterprise scale budgets, Um, flooding the market, what you see is that cloud providers like Microsoft and Amazon are doubling down and increasing their investments in this space and in this technology very, very quickly. Interesting where, uh, you know, the demand is coming from and and how that helps um, enterprises actually, again, in return, you know, be uh, better at doing uh, technology. And and what's your experience in you know, in, in Stackery as a, as a platform team itself, like what are your learnings? Uh, would you would you be able to give us some best practices um, that have been helpful for your team? Yeah, absolutely. So first off, I think the model of who does what is changing and you have to be intentional about that. So while for a background task or for your first Hello World project, it may not matter very much if you have, 
monitoring, if you have health visibility, if you have performance checks, if you have centralized logging. In order to get into production, your developers need to be responsible for that and they need to know it and they need to be trained how to do it right. Or they need a tool like Stackery that they can standardize on that will do that automatically for them. In, in either event, you, you want to make sure that the right people know what their responsibilities are on the new system, the new way of doing things. So I would say that's number one. Number two is that there are certain engineering tasks that are pretty easy to do in a long lived, you know, traditional server model that actually become harder to do in serverless models. And so it's important to kind of rethink architecture uh, designs and, and be willing to learn again and find new ways of doing things. Let me give you one quick example. Um, serverless is well designed to scale out very quickly. So you have a, a, a queue of events you could spin up a thousand instances or a million instances to run through that whole queue all at once asynchronously. And so you can, you can complete a large amount of work very quickly and then scale right back down to zero once you complete that workload. And it doesn't cost anymore to do that. So you might be tempted to use that model very commonly. But say, for example, you're using a third-party API. You probably don't want to asynchronously hit that API with a million requests. You may have some kind of rate limit you need to enforce. Um, these are some design patterns that are actually harder to do with serverless. How do you um, meter and slow down transaction volume? Now, you may not normally want to, but there are going to be times when that's an appropriate pattern. So coming with fresh eyes and thinking about serverless technology intentionally, thinking about what the implications are of how serverless is actually implemented under the scenes, and taking advantage of the parts that are abstracted from you and the parts that you know, your service provider will manage, um, I don't think that necessarily takes away the need to understand how under the covers it's working. So be curious and try to learn more about serverless if you, if you start embracing it. Great, uh, very helpful. And what, what are your best references for learning more about serverless generally as you, you, know, as you see the, the, the trends evolve? Yeah, so Kishore, I hope you can share some links with your audience. Sam Local is a great resource if you're getting started on AWS. Uh, and I'd also recommend um, checking out a blog by a cloud guru. Uh, they're a AWS uh, and, and cloud provider training consultancy. It does a lot of work and, and collects a lot of the best thinking around serverless. It's a great entry point. Um, if you're looking for providers in the space, I'd also check out IOPipe. Their performance monitoring will give you insight into how serverless is actually working, which I think will help train your team and, and level up your skill a lot more quickly. Great. Are you available on Twitter, LinkedIn, that folks can reach out? Like, What's the best way to, uh, to reach out to you and your team? Absolutely. So you can find us at stackery.io. Uh, you can also check us out on Twitter. We're stackery.io. And on Medium. Uh, we have a blog called Stacks on Stacks that we share. The blog is also replicated on our website, so you can go to stackery.io slash blog. Amazing. I'll include all these links um, and, and communication handles. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Nate, for, for spending some time and, and giving us this deep knowledge on, on serverless, also the ecosystem and where things are headed. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll make sure that there is uh, all the links included. Any, any last pointers that you want to mention? No, thanks so much for having me, Kishore. And I hope your audience has fun playing with serverless technology. Thank you. Thanks, Nate. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at sc-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.